Hey, welcome back everybody. This is the second episode in my historic KSP NASA mission series. But before I begin, I have a little bit of a confession to make. My last video wasn't really a NASA video. See, NASA wasn't established until later in the same year that Explorer 1 was launched. Explorer 1, like I mentioned, was mostly the purview of JPL and the military. But I think this serves as a nice little plug for one of the most influential yet forgotten government agencies in U.S. history, NACA. If you've never heard of it, then you're not alone, but it was essentially the predecessor to NASA before the S in National Aeronautics and Space Administration was actually a thing. NACA stood for National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, and it was concerned with a lot of early flight research in the United States. NACA was involved in the X-Plane project, which made Chuck Yeager the first human being to break the sound barrier in powered flight, and modern engineers still rely on NACA airfoils for many designs today. Okay, so enough NACA history and on to NASA. This video's mission is Freedom 7, otherwise known as Mercury Redstone 3, the first launch of an American into space. A few years after the launch of Explorer 1, the Soviets captured yet another spaceflight milestone by putting this guy, Yuri Gagarin, into space. Gagarin achieved an apogee of about 330 kilometers above sea level, then landed in the Soviet Union near what is now the border between Russia and great and glorious Kazakhstan. Interestingly, the Soviets hid the fact that he parachuted out of his capsule at about an uh, altitude of 23,000 feet, because aeronautical rules of the time said that to set flight records, you actually had to land with your aircraft. It was only after the second man into space, German Titov, told the world that he parachuted out of his own capsule that anyone knew about Gagarin's landing method. Aeronautics officials decided that the achievement was more important than the rules, though, and Gagarin got to keep the title of the first man in space. Cut to America, where NASA's Project Mercury was lagging behind. At the time of Gagarin's flight, America had only put a few rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees into space, and Americans were again shocked and upset that the Soviets had won yet another space race battle. But regardless, three weeks after Gagarin's flight, Alan Shepard became the first American in space, launched by a Redstone rocket, yet another adaptation of the Jupiter C military rocket. Instead of solid upper stages like the rocket that brought the Explorer 1 satellite into orbit, the Redstone only had the liquid stage, and atop it sat the Mercury capsule with a launch escape system tower at the top, just in case it became necessary to abort the mission. So in this video, I wanted to spell out some of my goals a little bit more clearly from the start. My Mercury Redstone recreation must include, first and foremost, a KSP equivalent apoapsis, to Freedom 7's maximum height of 188 kilometers. Since this is 88 kilometers, or about 90% above the official end line of the atmosphere at 100 kilometers, I decided to go 90% uh, above KSP's atmosphere end line at 70 kilometers to an apoapsis of 130 kilometers. I'm also going to say that an error of plus or minus 10% is okay, since I was a little bit lax on my Explorer 1 orbit due to the uh, difficulty of using the solid rocket engines. A uh, launch escape system, or LES, at the top is also going to be needed. Uh, the LES has to jettison at the same time as the main engine cutoff, but also must be available to use if the uh, flight goes wrong before that. This means that I'm going to have to set it up with an action group. The stage above the liquid stage must have a three-axis attitude control, just like the Mercury capsules, and I'll use RCS for that. Uh, next, uh, it must have rockets to retrofire uh, near apoapsis, and then finally it has to parachute into the ocean to the east of the Kerbal Space Center, and it's going to have to do that safely so that our brave Kerbal knot can be rescued by the Kernavy. Okay, so this... of the LES system just to show that it works. Um, I actually modified the real one a little bit from this to only have the engines in the top, but you can see the parachutes deploy there. The tower didn't quite separate, but it separates right there. And then we've got the tower falling down to Kerbin and exploding. And he's floating safely to the ground. And then this is my first test, which is unsuccessful because I did not put all the rocket motors on the same action group. But it's okay, because that moves Jeb up to my 
first pilots, my action pilots. Um, this is the final construction of the spacecraft. I scrapped it a few times and, and started over. You can see that I'm putting the separatrons to the top at an angle. That's thanks to advice that I got from Reddit because I tried it over and over and the rocket exhaust was actually uh, pushing down the the pod and completely ruining the effect of the tower because the thing would just stand still. Um, here I put on the parachutes. I couldn't really use the um, the the the, the big chutes actually have specific drogue chute and large chute, which there were two separate ones on Freedom the, C, the Freedom 7 mission, but I couldn't really fit them uh, because of the tower, so I just put two of those uh, side chutes. And then I put on an ASAS. The actual mission did have uh, a sort of automated flight computers, uh, and it also had the ability to be piloted manually from inside the pod inside the capsule rather um, and then on the bottom of that is the RCS for the attitude control the two separatrons on the side are to simulate the retro firers the retro firer yeah uh, which were actually kind of underneath but um, we don't really have solid rocket motors in KSP that can do that so I'm again simulating them with separatrons We've got uh, what's basically the the Jupiter C part of the rocket right there uh, with tail fins. Uh, they were actually really near the bottom on the actual rocket, but you can't really do that in KSP either. But I mean that's that's similar. I'm just getting the staging right here because uh, I want that very top stack separator to fire off at the same time as the the bottom uh, decoupler there, so that the main capsule and computer and all that fires off at the same time that the tower fires off. And then finally the last touch is to take all of the rockets and put them in the same action group as the, the middle decoupler there so that that'll be my abort sequence. And then rename it Freedom 7. Save it. And then we are all set for launch. Alright, so this is the Mercury Redstone 3 rocket on the launch pad. In real life, it took off at about 9 o'clock in the morning, so I kind of tried to get roughly there. It's probably 10 or 11 carbon time in the actual game. And I tried to pitch over a little bit right away. Um, about 15 seconds until launch um, on Mercury Redstone 3. Uh, the rocket pitched over about 2 degrees per second from 90 degrees to 45 degrees. So I've got it about, uh, so let's say, 30 degrees, 20 or 30 degrees pitch right there. Uh, really, in, in, in KSP, you want to just go straight up right away. But uh, the reason that most NASA rockets will pitch over pretty quickly is because you want to, there's safety concerns, you want to get the rocket downrange from the launch site as soon as possible, so if anything goes wrong, you're not going to have debris and everything raining down, and also, uh, if you have to eject, then it's probably going to be over water, which might give you a little bit softer of a landing. Uh, the, the actual flight reached maximum dynamic pressure about a minute and 30 seconds in minute 20 seconds, minute 30 seconds in, that's the point where uh, the speed of the rocket increasing uh, creates a maximum amount of pressure, aerodynamic pressure, on the rocket, and then after that it's going to keep going down because the density of the atmosphere is going down. Uh, you can see that we are increasing altitude, increasing apoapsis. I had to. I really had to keep the throttle down pretty far because I didn't want to. I didn't want to over overshoot my velocity in the in the lower atmosphere. I probably could have used the same amount of fuel with a smaller engine, but I felt it didn't really go with the aesthetic of the of the big fuel tanks and everything. But uh, if you throttle it down, I don't think that's really a big deal. 
So you can see that we're getting pretty much halfway through the atmosphere right now. Running a little bit low on fuel. I got it to the point where it just about has exactly the right amount of, of delta V. And here I, I, I'm increasing the throttle. And it's going to flame out at just about 130 kilometers. So I got just about right where I wanted, right within that, that plus or minus 10% range. So I was pretty happy with that. This was actually my first time with this rocket. We got the, the, the LES tower shooting off into the distance, and also the launch vehicle separating from the spacecraft itself. Jeb still thrilled, as I'm sure Alan Shepard was during his mission. Uh, in real life, uh, once the spacecraft separated, about 10 seconds later, they did a turnaround maneuver to point the capsule uh, retrograde uh, to put the heat shield in a sort of forward position. And then Alan Shepard, he didn't have a window like this. He had no windows on the Mercury capsule. It actually had a periscope that had to extend. Uh, it took a, some pictures out of the periscope and also, I believe, uh, inspected the spacecraft. That's why I, I turned around to see the the launch vehicle there because I th I, I'm pretty sure that they uh, they, they, they checked the, the launch vehicle too to see if there were any problems with it and what happened during the launch and everything like that. Uh, it was actually a really short flight. The entire flight, if you, if you looked at that graphic that I had in the beginning of the video, the entire flight was like 15 minutes and 30 seconds. So it was a pretty short trip into space, but it's really just more or less a ballistic trajectory into space. Uh, right around Apogee, uh, they did a retro fire, so I'm gonna I'm I'm just warping forward to get to Apogee. The reason I mean it's a ballistic trajectory, like I said. The reason that you they, they did a retro fire was because they needed to adjust the trajectory to account for the fact that the heat shields uh, had certain tolerance. <laughs> certain angle back to the atmosphere. That's not a concern in KSP yet, uh, but hopefully in the future. Uh, I, I heard that the devs said that they're going to have uh, re-entry heat, and that's going to be pretty awesome. So I did the retro fire, separated the uh, the bottom stages and the computer work and all that, and now just got to fall back to Kerbin. So actually a surprising amount of stuff was automated in this mission. Um, the spacecraft uh, did the turnaround maneuver in uh, automatically 180 degrees. Uh, it turned the spacecraft around. It also orientated the spacecraft uh, automatically during the retro uh, maneuver, and it also detected re-entry and rolled the spacecraft uh, properly for that. The computer that did that was called the ASCS, so that's actually pretty similar to the ASAS that we have in. Kerbal Space Program, uh, except that ASCS stood for Automatic Stabilization and Control System, whereas uh, ASAS stands for Automated, or uh, actually Advanced Stability Augmentation Module, or uh, Stability Augmentation System, rather. Uh, so it's pretty different, but I, I suspect that it, it might have had something to do with how they named uh, the part in KSP. So here we have Jeb. Uh, parachuting back to the planet Kerbin. Uh, in reality, the uh, Freedom 7 capsule had uh, one drogue chute that deployed to stabilize and start to slow down the capsule, and then another uh, normal parachute deployed to actually completely slow it down. And the capsule also had a snorkel on it that uh, automatically uh, extended so that uh, Alan Shepard could get oxygen from within his uh, capsule and then obviously it landed like that and uh, the Navy uh, recovered Alan Shepard uh, from a green dye marker that uh, showed visually where he was and also a recovery radio beacon so I've got Jeb going for a little swim there uh, that looks like a successful mission to me I met all the requirements that I put forth for myself uh, I hope you guys watch the next video. It's probably going to be John Glenn. Thanks for watching, uh, and happy flying.